The life of famous Apache chief Geronimo could have been a quiet and peaceful one, had he been born in a different time. Instead, he found himself surviving in tumultuous times of westward expansion that included the Mexican-American War, the Apache-Mexico War, and the Apache Wars and Civil War in the United States. A lot was going on. What follows is a tale fraught with bloody battles, daring escapes, and betrayals so fantastic, you'd swear it was cooked up in a Hollywood blockbuster film. Today, we're telling you the story of the life of the iconic Apache chief, Geronimo. But before we get started, make sure you're subscribed to the Weird History channel. Then head to the comments and let us know what other legendary figures of American history you want to hear about. For now, let's leap into some weird history. Geronimo! Geronimo was born in 1829 in what is now the U.S. state of New Mexico. And although his conflict with the United States Cavalry became his legacy, Geronimo's warpath was initially homegrown, brought on by a raid by the Mexican military. It was the summer of 1858 when Geronimo and his Apache band traded with the town of Casquilla, what's now known as Hanos in Chihuahua, Mexico. While he and his men were away one afternoon, Mexican soldiers raided their Apache camp, stole what they could, and eliminated almost everyone. Geronimo would end up not appreciating that. The Mexican soldiers were retaliating against Geronimo for raids he conducted against nearby Mexican towns. Such raiding and subsequent counter-raiding was kind of a tit-for-tat hobby that had been going on for hundreds of years, since Spanish settlers appeared in that area in the early 1600s. And raiding wasn't an uncommon tactic, even between Apache tribes, as a way to acquire cattle, food, horses, and people. When Geronimo returned to find that the soldiers had slain his wife, mother, and three children, his entire family, he lost all purpose in his life, but found it shortly thereafter in the form of revenge. For almost a year, Geronimo solicited help from different tribes to get revenge against the Mexican army. That's the kind of vengeful patience they make Charles Bronson movies about. As he assembled members of surrounding Apache tribes to avenge those massacred, they decided no one would be better to lead the battle than Geronimo, because his loss was deemed the greatest. He led the Apache warriors into a bloody two-hour-long battle that saw the defeat of just about every foe on the battlefield. Geronimo himself dispatched dozens of men until he was left with nothing but his knife. He later wrote of the whirlwind experience of succeeding in battle, exacting his revenge, and almost immediately rising in stature as a wartime leader. After that battle, most of the Apaches in the war party went back to business as usual, but not Geronimo. In a pattern that would repeat dozens of times over the following years, he recruited more warriors to accompany him on some good old-fashioned raiding down in Mexico. But in this instance, when they attacked a village, he and his two compatriots were surprised by multiple Mexican gunmen that responded. Geronimo's companions were slain, and he was surrounded by armed, angry soldiers. But Geronimo said, nah. He escaped and fled back to Arizona while being closely pursued by soldiers on foot, and built for comfort New Balance sneakers were still decades away, making that feat all the more impressive. The most battle damage many people experience is taking a dodgeball to the head, which usually meant you could skip the rest of gym class. Well, replace dodgeball with hot speeding lead, and you have Geronimo's story. Fueled by his initial success and vengeance, Geronimo continued on his warpath, but each subsequent raid on the Mexican people ended in beatings and heavy losses. These defeats led to warriors returning empty-handed, and sometimes with brand new holes in their bodies. Geronimo had a penchant for taking abuse. In one attack, he faced death when he slipped in a pool of blood and got clubbed with the butt of a Mexican soldier's rifle, only to have his life saved when a fellow warrior dispatched, with a flying spear, the soldier wielding that rifle. That clubbing resulted in one of the eight battle wounds he would carry throughout his life. In another nearly successful raid, the Apaches were followed by soldiers who shot Geronimo several times. The opening volley hit him right in the face. But Geronimo either didn't notice or didn't care because, as the story goes, he got right back up and fought his way to safety. And that is more than we can say for the dodgeball court. Since fighting battle after battle was giving the Apache tribe diminishing returns, they decided to try living in peace even with more settlers and military entering the region. The chief of Geronimo's tribe, Mangus, Colorado, traveled to the settlement of Apache Tejo to broker a peace deal with the military officers at Fort McLean. 
The deal was to end raiding activities by offering food and supplies to the Apache bands who would live peacefully near the town. You've probably heard the old adage, if something seems too good to be true, it usually is. Well, Mangus Colorado found this out the hard way when he led half the tribe to Apache Tejo. It turned out to be a double cross, resulting in the whole lot of them being slain by U.S. soldiers. Although there are reports that the death of Mangus Colorado happened years earlier, a death that happened under murky circumstances while jailed by the U.S. Army. The ever wily Geronimo, when half the tribe failed to return, escaped with the rest of the tribe. And after the dust had finally settled and his people were safe again, his Apache tribe named Geronimo the Tribal Chief. And his reputation began to precede him, if it hadn't already. It was the summer of 1863, and the smell of fresh grass and a successful raid was in the air. The Apaches were in need of supplies, so Geronimo led a raid on a small village near Casa Grande. According to Geronimo's account, nobody did anything about it. There was no meaningful resistance whatsoever, not even a, how do you do? As soon as the villagers saw the Apache coming, they hoofed it out of town. Too sweet, suffering just a single casualty. With no one around to stop them, Geronimo and his warriors kicked off their shoes, feasted for a full 24 hours, and handed out gifts from their pillages. The Apaches were able to empty the town, steal several ponies, and carry their loot back home. In the 1870s, with all sides tiring of conflict, Geronimo and his people were able to move back into Fort Bowie, New Mexico. Upon their arrival, Geronimo spoke with a man in charge, General Oliver Otis Howard, a former Civil War officer whose treatment of Native Americans earned him respect amongst the Apache and the nickname, the Christian General. Geronimo was one of those admirers. The legendary chief wrote that the general always treated the Apache as brothers, and that he, Geronimo, never had as good a friend in the U.S. as Howard. He went as far as to say that, as the purest white man in the U.S. Army, Howard's time as commander of the Apache's post was remembered fondly. But that time wouldn't last. Roughly a year later, several important Apache chiefs and warriors were invited to confer at Fort Bowie under the guise of peace, largely to end raids being led by Apache tribal chief Cochise. Anyone familiar with the Red Wedding episode of Game of Thrones already knows where we're going with this. The group was led into a tent where they were ambushed. Several were cut down by soldiers and others were captured. But if you've learned anything about Geronimo by this point, it's that you should never give him a reason for revenge. In retaliation for this treachery, Geronimo banded together two other Apache tribes and attacked a freight train. They captured several prisoners and offered a prisoner exchange for those taken at Fort Bowie. The U.S. Army refused, and Geronimo made good on his threat. The prisoners were eliminated, and Geronimo's crew disappeared into the mountains, further solidifying his fearsome reputation. The next few decades would take a toll on Geronimo and his Apache warriors. After being surrounded on all sides by Mexican troops in 1883, it seemed the Apache chief's ticket had finally been punched. That's when Geronimo managed to sneak into the enemy encampment, just in time to hear a rousing speech from a Mexican general. During the speech, the general referred to Geronimo and his hated band as Red Devils. He instructed his troops to be merciless and take no prisoners, be they man, woman, or child. The speech did not sit well with Geronimo. So he did what most of us would probably do. He took aim and fatally blasted the general where he stood. A battle erupted, and the ensuing chaos provided enough of a distraction for Geronimo and his Apache troops to escape into the nearby mountains. Thirty years is a long time to do anything, especially constant fighting. Geronimo was ready to settle down with his people at Apache Pass and live out his days telling kids to get off his lawn. But once the beloved General Howard left, things between the military, the settlers, and Native Americans became tense. Geronimo himself was once jailed for four months for just leaving the reservation. Although, in fairness, he is the kind of person you need to keep track of. During this time, U.S. forces asked prominent chiefs and warriors to meet with them at Apache Pass to discuss future relations. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, well, you only have yourself to blame. That's why the Apache fled the reservation, for fear of another trap. This did little to stop the advancing troops. After being pursued and attacked relentlessly, Geronimo and his band of 250 Apache tried to fight their way to freedom. After running for so long, with no place left to go, Geronimo ultimately surrendered to U.S. troops. This was to be the final surrender of the Apache chief's life. 
and he raised the white flag to Lieutenant Charles B. Gatewood, who was played by Jason Patrick in the movie. Nobody should have to surrender to the Star of Speed 2. Geronimo was toured around the country in parades and celebrations like an old Batmobile, including the second inauguration of President Theodore Roosevelt. He presided over what was left of the Apache tribe. He wrote about how much of what was promised the Apache was not delivered, attended the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904, where he marveled at riding a Ferris wheel. He was a pioneer in self-branding by selling his own autographs. He participated in Wild West shows, became a member of the Dutch Reformed Church, and when he finally slowed down, he kept house for one of his adult daughters. Oh, and he also dictated his autobiography, Geronimo's Story of His Life, which you can still get today. In February of 1909, after an evening of drinking, Geronimo was flung from his horse and lay in the rain all night before he was found. He succumbed to pneumonia a few days later. The last words of this hell-raising warrior was a request that his daughter always be looked after. So what do you think? Which facts about Geronimo's life surprised you the most? Let us know in the comments below. And while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from our Weird History.